Marcus Philly is an ex-competitive CrossFit athlete, placing 12th in the world at the CrossFit Games in 2016. Functional bodybuilding is the method Marcus teaches, looking good, moving well, and training for longevity. Marcus, welcome to Fitness FAQs. Man, I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I've been following your channel for quite some time now. And so when you reached out first, I was. Uh, it happens periodically where I'm just like a little personally starstruck. I'm like, wow, somebody wants to, that I admire is, wants to talk to me. So this is exciting for me as well. Awesome, man. The feeling's mutual. Followed your work for a long time. And I think you've got a lot of gems to offer. So to start with, how does functional bodybuilding address the limitations of CrossFit? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think functional bodybuilding was, I mean, functional bodybuilding was in fact born out of my experience with CrossFit. So I think it's, uh, I mean, people with the intro, they, okay, this guy had some experience in CrossFit, um, but it was a long one. It wasn't just as a, uh, you know, competitive athlete. It was as a, a gym owner. So I owned a, I owned a CrossFit box. I coached for close to 10 years in the CrossFit space. Um, and so I saw a lot of the value and I mean, the beauty of CrossFit, I really subscribed to it for many years. Um, and it made a huge impact on me as a professional and on the relationships I built with clients and the success that a lot of clients had. And it introduced a lot of people that might otherwise maybe never have come into contact with strength and conditioning. It introduced them to, uh, lifting weights and moving their body in intense ways that, um, probably changed their perspective on fitness forever in good and bad ways. But, you know, I just want to highlight that there were a lot of good things. Um, However, when I wrapped up my career in competitive CrossFit, you know, there was a, I was very much doing the sport training for CrossFit, not the methodology, maybe as it was meant to be delivered to the masses. It's, uh, you know, taking anything to the professional sport level, uh, means, you know, pushing in ways that are not conducive to perhaps longevity or, or optimal health. And I found myself knowing that I needed to change how I was going to approach fitness. Um, I couldn't just do high intensity, you know, functional movements performed across broad time modal domain that, you know, however, the CrossFit um, methodology is packaged and, and sort of uh, spoken about. And so what I looked at with functional bodybuilding was, and it wasn't, I didn't call it functional bodybuilding. I just said, okay, I, I need to slow down. There's a lot of intensity going on in CrossFit and pushing hard and fast and really racing against the clock and trying to push for maximal load on a semi-consistent basis um, just wasn't wasn't working for me and it, and it wasn't working for a lot of my clients. Years prior to my retirement, I had started to incorporate different aspects of strength conditioning into our CrossFit classes supersetting, you know, resistance training, tempo work, uh, building strength, um, and, uh, you know, conditioning programs that really separated the two disciplines rather than always combining them into a single, um, workout. And so those are the things that I looked at as, okay, these are not, these are perhaps missing elements of CrossFit. They're not you know, what, what, it, what CrossFit is, isn't necessarily broken, but we need to kind of fill in some of the gaps that get people to slow down, to honor the quality of movement over the quantity and the speed of movement. Um, and how can we do that in a way that gets people excited, you know, about training the way that CrossFit got people excited about training. And that to me was the puzzle to sort of solve for. And that's what functional bodybuilding was built out of. Sounds like you've really tried to separate the elements, as you just said. So not doing strength, power, endurance, cardio, always in the same session. How have you gone about integrating that into, say, a workout week where you kind of get the best of all worlds and, and touch on each piece? Yeah, great question. I mean, it's also important for people to understand that, you know, CrossFit at its, at its core was dedicated to 
breaking up disciplines. You know, you in the original days of CrossFit.com, there was a 5K run for time. So that's that's a monostructural discipline, right? There was, you know, five sets of three in the weighted chin up, you know, so they, they had broken up disciplines. Um, however, most people recognize CrossFit for the, and, and, the, and certainly the CrossFit games has sort of highlighted you, you deadlift, you sprint and you do push ups or handstand press ups, you know, all together. And, um, and that to me is, is probably the thing that will last forever for me about in the impression that CrossFit had on me was this concept of mixing different domains together, mixed, mixing modals of training, modalities of training together is really can be done very elegantly and, and safely and smartly in a way that challenges our capacity and adds a different training stimulus and intensity stimulus, you know, which just like anything can be dosed too much or dosed the right amount. But within functional bodybuilding, we like to um, probably bias a bit more of the, you know, isolated, separate aspects of training. Um, every day in a functional bodybuilding program, we'll have resistance training elements that are on their own. It will have some some body weight training of some sort or, you know, uh, on its own where people are learning how to move their bodies in space, um, whether it be in a, a warm up capacity or setting, whether it's in a resistance training, like doing bar dips or strict chin ups, um, or doing back squats and wanting to give people more time to focus on those strength development movements, um, and aspects of training without having to worry about the fatigue and uh, other stimulus of the really cardiovascular stimulus that comes from doing CrossFit, classic CrossFit mixed workouts. So that's that's one thing. The, the second thing is that our work capacity or conditioning, I use those a lot interchangeably, but we, we, we mix in cardio, you know, to, to most functional bodybuilding work, workout sessions. There's some strength, some, some conditioning that happens. Um, when we do that, we don't always go to the, do three exercises back to back to back. Some days we'll in fact, just give our customers a chance to do pure aerobic work, you know, get on a rowing machine and row for this period of time and then stop. Uh, so we introduce a lot of interval training and, um, which is, not that intervals don't show up in CrossFit, but by and large, it's here's a body of work, go do it as fast as you can, and then you're done. Versus do this at 90% and then rest. Do this at 90% and then rest. And those are very important and ingrained principles in the functional bodybuilding method. Not, you know, and this is many people's methods of training, right? But so interval conditioning is key. Um, so separating different disciplines of fitness even within a functional bodybuilding workout across a week, um, letting people see more, see strength training more frequently. So that was something that, you know, it's like, Hey, strength training is, has such a carryover to so many people's fitness goals that it shouldn't just be the thing that we do one out of the four days a week of training. It should be something maybe that you focus on each day. Um, and then perhaps the last thing, cause I don't, want to continue going on and on, but it is um, really looking at repetition or uh, sort of a, a framework for training that is predictable and repeatable. Meaning in CrossFit, most CrossFit methodology programming that you see out there that really sticks to the true essence of what CrossFit stood for was that it's constantly varied. So a customer that came in and trained on Monday at CrossFit, they did deadlifts, but next Monday they were doing push presses. And the next Monday they were doing a 5k run and they might not see the deadlift again for four to six weeks. And that inconsistency of seeing movements over and over again, I don't believe allowed for most people to progress, you know, um, in a, in a systematic way that they could predict and, and get excited about, you know, cause people love to see their week to week progress, not just testing a benchmark every four months. 
So that became something that I really adopted even before I left and uh, I sold my CrossFit gym was, hey, Mondays for the next six weeks, we're, we're back squatting or we're doing you know pull-ups and expect to see that because most people have a routine. They come on Monday or they come on Tuesday. And after six weeks, we switch up the order so that we could kind of service the needs of all of our customers. So the Tuesday, Thursday client didn't miss back squats for the rest of their life because we just kept them on Monday. Yeah, exactly. I feel that this almost generalist fitness philosophy that you've just described is something that most people subscribe to. I feel that people that want to specialize tend to do that for shorter periods of time. But I feel at large, people want to get into health and fitness, longevity to be in this for the long haul. And I often find that people tend to gravitate towards wanting to do a lot of things, doing them pretty well and progressing in all those domains of fitness that you just described. The problem is the expectations. I feel that when people try and do a lot of different things, cardio, strength, hypertrophy, maybe some skill stuff with Olympic lifting, they can sometimes feel a bit dejected with their progress compared to maybe someone that's specializing. Can you just outline what are realistic expectations for someone doing functional bodybuilding? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll just first agree with what you said, you know, somebody who's, it's, it's kind of in the same vein as like, I'm going to take a really slow and steady and, you know, long-term approach to changing my diet and losing weight. You know, that person who barely sees the scale move in the first month, but they're implementing good habits that are going to pay off two years from now, they might not be as motivated as the person who did the very unsustainable crash diet, but lost 10 pounds in the first month. And they, they feel great, you know, so there's kind of pros and cons, obviously, to both of these. Um, so I think what we what we say with, you know, be, and, we, and I have to look at who's the type of person who's coming to functional bodybuilding. You know, I think the person that resonates with our message is somebody who hasn't found that consistency. Maybe they've tried the, you know, certainly at, at first, I was the person who was very singularly focused. I shifted gears towards this way of training and my audience was like, yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I've been riding the CrossFit wave for you with you for the past three to five years. I want to go do something that feels a bit more balanced and I can be consistent with it for more years to come. So that's certainly one of the things that we set as an expectation. It's like, look, you're going to, you know, <laughs> if you want to build the most muscle possible, like functional bodybuilding is not the place to come to. Like you go to these different, you know, hypertrophy, uh, specialists, right. Um, and if you want to be the best calisthenics athlete, you know, that you could be, this is not the place for you to optimize that. Um, but you're going to get a touch of each and you have to just temper your expectations. You're not going to, you know, become great at any of these one, any one of these disciplines. Now, with that said, a lot, a great number of people who are out there seeking fitness are, I believe, are not looking for a specific performance outcome. They're looking for a well-being, maybe a sense of energy, and probably m more so in most cases, they're looking to change their body composition. So that is something that can all those things can absolutely be accomplished and perhaps just as quickly, if not more quickly, you know, inside of a program that is, uh, you know, spread around different disciplines and you're, you're, you're a generalist on a generalist program. You can lose body fat very, very, very quickly. Should, you know, if you, if you do the other principles correctly, if you do a generalist program, uh, you can start to feel better very quickly. And the reason I, the way I think about it is if you're coming to functional bodybuilding and you're trying to solve for the issue of, I haven't found the thing that's made me consistent, then this is absolutely the place that's, I believe, you know, I, I believe strongly that there's enough variety and there's a general enough approach that I think anybody can find something about it that they love and therefore want to come back next week and next, you know, tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and the next week, and the next month. And that is the fastest track to your goals. Uh, 
regardless of what program you follow. It's just that that consistency factor. So that's what we kind of that's what I lean into the most. And um yeah, it's it's embedded in all of our all of our messaging with our company. I like the fact that you're being realistic and I like the fact that you're promoting that there's going to be success in each of those domains. And I feel that that's key with pretty much everyone, the average person, for a lack of a better word. Once you see that success, that's the ultimate buy-in there. That's when you are consistent. That's when you don't need motivation per se because you're seeing things trending upwards. And there's so many different pieces to improve that you're just going to be doing it for a long period of time. Yeah, we we talk about it internally. I, I talk about it with my business partner and um, she sort of heads up our marketing department. But, you know, one of our goals in 2023 was like, how do we, you know, let's focus a lot of our energy on how do we help our customers develop quick, early wins, you know, and, and, and that could be, we've really pushed ourselves to think about that beyond physical transformations, right? So like, yeah, I want somebody in the first week to lose five pounds. Like, you know, that would be, that might be really great for a certain subset of, of individuals, but that's not the only wins we're talking about. It's not just like body composition changes or get them stronger quickly. It's reminding them that, Hey, you just finished your, you know, you just did three workouts in a row. When was the last time you did that? That's a win. Like you logged on to your training app because you've been on 10 other training apps in the last 10 training apps you downloaded and you, you opened once and you never opened again. But this one, you just did three consecutive days of training and you logged results or, you know, so that's just an example of getting those early wins that get people like, Oh my gosh, I can, ex- I f- I'm experiencing right now in this moment that there was some positive feedback loop from doing this. And that's going to get them on board for the next, you know, week or the next 30 days. And then once they've had two, three wins in that time span, you know, you might have that person now hooked for a long time and those are going to keep compounding for them. What would you say are the key principles behind any successful fitness method? I mean, not to sound like a broken record, but like a successful fitness method, it certainly is something that gets people to come back and do it over and over again. You know, if there's, there's gotta be an enjoyment, uh, there's got to be a, a sense of satisfaction that comes from the doing of the thing. You know, uh, you don't have to like love to lift heavy weights, but you've had an opportunity to experience that in the process of lifting the weights, like, you know, when I do the thing that's hard, I sense the reward to it, you know, and, and therefore you enjoy the process. Um, that. And that's going to be different for every every person that you know sort of shows up. It's some people love to do functional bodybuilding, and some people just don't, and that's okay. You know, it doesn't mean it's a it's a bad fitness method or approach. It just means it wasn't right for that that individual. Um, but then I would also say, like, I believe most, you know, and and this is again how I define success or successful fitness method, but. I think a a successful fitness method really does have to have a balance of, you know, strength or resistance training and some approach to cardiovascular health and fitness. So I, I know people will say, Hey, well, you can get all that, all the benefits that you need out of, you know, just a resistance training program. You don't have to do any cardio. Some people are like, I'm just a cardio person. I don't like to lift weights. And, um, I see some draw I see some drawbacks to really being one dimensional in that respect. You know, so um now that that could mean like, you know, your discipline could be very singularly focused, like you're a grappler. Well, there's resistance training and cardiorespiratory training involved in grappling. And so you're like, uh, you know, grappling's my one thing. I'm not I just think there needs to be some touch on, you know building up the, uh, I guess the creatine, creatine phosphate energy system and then the aerobic, you know, oxidative phosphorylation systems in the body. For the people that only do resistance training and they don't care about cardio, what is the benefit of them incorporating cardio for their resistance training? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I think probably, I mean, for the resistance training or for them, uh, maybe I could answer the question two different ways. I think just for the resistance training itself, um, I think if you have a better cardiovascular, uh, or let's call it VO2 max, you just have more aerobic capacity, your ability to recover between sets is improved. Um, now there's a certain amount of cardiovascular training that would maybe detract from the results and the efficacy of your resistance training. It might just become too intense, but a certain threshold, you know, if you don't go above it, yeah, you're going to see a much better recovery time and you're going to be able to do more, more volume in your training, effective volume in your training. You know, junk volume, it's like uh, this idea that at some point in the resistance training session, you your intensity level drops and you're now just doing reps that are not that not sufficiently intense. Well, intensity can drop because your nervous system's just kind of shot, which aerobic training is not really going to help. Um, but people can just get tired and winded and just like this lose. They, they kind of like they get tuckered out, you know, and that can be uh, a product of just poor cardiovascular health. They're expending a lot of energy cardiovascularly in between sets and they can't quite recover. So that could be one, one important reason why cardio could support a weight training or resistance training program. The second I think is recovery time from, from training. So, um, you know, in my CrossFit uh, competitive days, you know, we did a lot of intensity and, and a lot of training volume. Um, and on some of the most, you know, sessions that created a lot of muscle damage, um, similar to like a, a hard resistance training, uh, session with maybe a lot of, a lot of bias towards the eccentric contractions, we would get on and do zone two cardio, you know, very, or even zone one cardio, just a lot of slow, relatively slow, steady state movement, like a simple bike or a simple, you know, bike was kind of my go-to because it was just the lowest complexity cardio tool that we had. It didn't have a lot of uh, impact. There wasn't really any eccentric loading. It was just blood flow getting those sessions were implemented as recovery tools. And it would, it would speed up the time, you know, between sessions. Now that could be said like, well, that's just general aerobic health helps that. But I, be I believe that timing those sessions between hard, you know, training bouts was also useful. So those are two things that I think would benefit the, the resistance training only uh, individual. And then the other, the other thing that comes up is like, someone says, Hey, I, I get everything I need from weight training. You know, it helps me look good. I feel good. Um, I love training weight with weights. Like, why would I need cardio? And it's kind of like, you don't know that you need it until you have a little bit of it. Like if you've never experienced it, then you don't know that you just feel better. Your mind works more effectively. You sleep better. You, I don't know that, you know, there's, of course there's too much of anything, but there's a sweet spot for like, you're a, you're a, you're a gym person. You love the weights and that's it. And you could care less about cardio. Yeah. Well, I love pizza, but a little bit of broccoli can help. You know, even if I don't love it, it's like, I get a little bit in there. I'm like, Oh, that makes me feel better. So yeah, there's a little bit of cardio that can go a long way to just overall improving, just like your experience of your health and wellness. Um, I'm sure somebody could get in here and talk, you know, uh, about the, you know, the biology behind that and what's happening on a cellular level from like, you know, your ability to turn over energy and your mitochondrial density and yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, it just, you just feel good, you know? And, um, so some people w want to feel good and they think they can feel as good as they could ever feel just by lifting weights. Well, you don't know until you've got a little bit of the other thing too. Cardio can be quite a complex topic and it can confuse people what would you recommend as far as, I guess, intensity and frequency to get the minimum effective dose for someone that just wants resistance training? 
I kind of I like I've I've kind of been someone who's subscribed to like maybe th- on a on a lower like a low level like three three thirty minute sessions a week of we'll call it I don't know zone I mean the zones some people understand that but it's like cardio at an effort where you can still have a you can still have a conversation you know you're not going to be able to like recite you know lengthy deep you know but you can you can chat with somebody you can go for a walk with a friend and you can talk you don't have to be powering up a mountain where you're like <laughs> i can't you know like that's not necessary um and that's a good starting place and i i, I kind of just like the three idea approach especially if you space them out throughout the week that you could do three sessions and you're never really taking more than a a day off from doing some cardio um getting in some cardio now you know what's 90 minutes out of your week somebody might say oh, that seems crazy it's like well stan efforting has just a great you know he's got his his 10 minute walks it's like after each meal go for a 10 minute walk and and that gets you a lot of benefit i mean he subscribes to that as like a daily practice but it's like hey if you know, let's, let's take some baby steps. I think if you just do one 30 minute session a week, you might really not scratch the, uh, you know, scratch the surface enough to start to feel those benefits. So that could be a place to, to start. And then it doesn't have to look any particular way. It could be walking. It could be stair climbing. It could be, you know, elliptical. It could be a recumbent bike. It could be anything. Um, and, you know, do whatever it takes to make it enjoyable, watch TV, you know, play a video game while you're doing it just make sure that like you know you're it's sustainable but you're doing the work and you know your breathing's up a little bit but don't go so hard that you can't you know you can't complete a thought as someone marcus who was an ex-competitive athlete how has your mindset changed after you retired and how you've approached training now as someone that's training more for for life sustainability and longevity well, one of the biggest things that changed when I really said I'm not going to do this competitively anymore was that the there's at least for me and in, in my chosen sport there's a certain amount of uh like almost fear and anxiety that was connected to the training. It was like, "Hey, I have to perform. I have to push myself in the gym today because there's this event coming and it just so happened that look i played other sports growing up um and there were different types of like you know fears and anxieties and like you know mental games that came along with it um but i was i never played another sport where i was like i was afraid of how badly it was going to hurt phys you know the, the physical pain of crossfit competitive crossfit was uh was real you know like there it it was it was it's an uncomfortable um, sport. You have to learn to get very comfortable with pain. And that happened, that took years. Like it wasn't until late into my career that I was like, Oh, this is going to hurt, but Hey, it's like, you know, it's okay. Like I'm, I, I know what it feels like. So there was that anxiety, that kind of mental and emotional turmoil that I was going through on a consistent basis. And, um, because again, pushing the physical limits so frequently, um, without that much of a skilled component to like sort of take our mind off. It was just like, just kind of at some point, you know, you, you had all the skills. I knew how to snatch. I knew how to muscle up. I knew, you know, I knew how to do these things. It was just now just do it as hard as you could. <laughs> and, uh, so that, that became very, a big drain on the, on, on my, on my life. And so giving that up, you know, I go into the gym now and I don't, I don't have anybody, there's nobody watching really, you know, I mean, I post things, but you know, my scores are not going to be on the leaderboard of the CrossFit open. And, um, and really most people that are watching, they just, they're more inspired by the consistency and the way I do the things than how much I'm lifting. Uh, and that's incredibly freeing. Um, and it also, you know, at times has left me wondering like, huh, I don't have, I don't have a built in, uh, sort of goal, like annual goal to like hold me accountable. Or I don't have like a built in accountability system, like the, the CrossFit open. Um, so am I just sort of phoning it in? Am I actually pushing myself that, you know, I, that question kind of 
bubbles up to the surface periodically. But I think, um, and then the other ways that that starts to manifest is like, okay, well, when I'm under the stress and the pressure of competing, you know, for points, and then when I face a moment in training where it's like, this is hard, and it's probably not the safest thing to to push it, but I'm going to push it. You know, you start to change. I started to change my threshold for risk tolerance dramatically, right? It was like, I'm doing this, I'm pushing it. And now it's like, but it's not important enough to push this. You know, matter of fact, my shoulder feels a little tweaky and I'm just going to take this whole week off of upper body. <laughs> like I don't, I'm not going to even, not going to try it. And whereas if that were the case in my CrossFit years, I would be incredibly stressed and worried that I, and, and I perhaps push through it, you know, um, which was a choice, you know, and, and a choice at the time I didn't ma I didn't have any regrets about. And I look back and I don't, I still don't have regrets about it, but did I pay the price for some of those choices? Sure. You know, and, but now I, I just changed that, changed that decision-making process, uh, pretty dramatically. What you've just said there is really relatable to people that aren't even athletes. I feel that most people, when they get into their fitness journey, as more often than not teenagers, young adults, they come with this certain sense of vigor, enthusiasm, which is great. You can really push yourself hard consistently, high intensity, but eventually there gets to a point that you transition. I feel for the people that keep doing it beyond five, 10 years plus. And it's just, as you've said there so eloquently, adopting more of a restrained intensity as opposed to just, I'm just going to crush myself every single session. It becomes a little bit more calculated. And as you said, you can know when it's time to push hard. You can know when it's time to pivot. And what you've just said there for myself as well, Marcus, is very relatable. You can at times catch yourself being like, Am I going a bit too easy on myself here? Should I, be, should I be actually pushing harder? But I think that that approach has sustainability and that might not be seen as hardcore to some people, but I think staying in the game and continuing to train on your terms with that mindset is a good transition for people that retire from a discipline or just transition to something that's a bit more manageable long-term. I agree, yeah. And I, I think that... Um it just so happened that, you know, I, I had a, a good amount of training under, uh, training experience under my belt before I found CrossFit, but not all of it was well-structured. And I don't believe I had, I was anywhere near like kind of tapping out my, you know, I, I hadn't reached advanced training status. I was still more of an intermediate trainee. And so the beginning and intermediate phases of your training, your, your, you know, training experience. Um, I think it was very good that I, it overlapped with my competitive CrossFit career, right? Cause like there's a lot on the table to be gained in those earlier years. And arguably if you're able to bring more intensity during those years, you might maximize your potential more than the person that took this sustainable approach when they were a beginner. You know, beginner gains are going to favor the person who pushes it hard and takes advantage of them, so to speak, than the person who maybe is, you know, spends too long sort of tempering their intensity. So that's not that's not to say like, hey, if you're a beginner, go out and smash your face into a wall and go hard. It's just that it happened, you know, the fact that those lined up for me in a way, it was like, I was pushing hard, but the, there was a lot to gain. I was seeing the gains. It was it was incredible. And then towards the end of my career, it was like, okay, like I'm I'm becoming a more refined CrossFitter. I have more skill. I have more knowledge of pacing. I have more knowledge of the sport, how to game it. I'm building my aerobic my aerobic capacity. Kept building. Some of my lifts, I was still getting stronger app, but nowhere near the type of growth I saw in the earlier years. So it was, you know, the, the returns were starting to look a little smaller and smaller, but this, the physical cost of pushing that hard was still quite high. 
Um, so that's, that's similar to somebody who enters into that advanced or that, you know, five, six, 10 year plus portion of their training career where it's like, yeah, I got to temper my intensity because <laughs> I'm going so hard and I'm getting, you know, m just these very min minuscule, not even a, you can't even perceive these, these changes. And is it, what's the, you know, now you're in the season of, of maintenance, sustainability, and then redefining what you want out of health and fitness. You know, now it's like at 38, I, and I've had a lot has changed in the last two, three years for me around this, where I'm just like, I just want to feel amazing. I want to have energy. I want to, I want to like show up to my kids and my wife and just be like, let's go and do these things and be energetic. And I don't want to be tired from, you know, I worked out too hard and, um, I don't want to be held back by that. Like, and I want to, so that might be in opposition to putting those extra 10 pounds on the barbell, you know? And so I don't, I don't want to make that choice. Today's sponsor for the show is Fitness FAQs. Use the coupon code PODCAST10 to save 10% at checkout when shopping on fitnessfaqs.com. Enjoy the discount and let's get back to the conversation. What would you say are the main movements and muscles that are neglected from most people's workouts? I think what I, I, what I could speak to is what I saw missing from my CrossFit experience. Um, and that was... Um, there was a there was a heavy reliance or yeah reliance on you know barbell training because you could get a bunch of barbells and weight plates in a gym for 20 class members but you couldn't get 20 sets of dumbbells it was a little harder especially a variety of different dumbbell weights they might have 10 sets of 50 pound dumbbells for the rx workout but they didn't have lighter dumbbells so it's a lot of a lot of bilateral movements, not a lot of unilateral movements. Um, a lot of, you know, two-legged squats, deadlifts, presses overhead. So that's one. I think people underutilizing unilateral exercises, lunges, split squats, single arm presses, even single arm pulling exercises. Um you know, from an, there was also not a lot of, uh, you know, this, a lot of people fall into the narrative of compound is best because it, you know, compound exercises get you the most, uh, you know, calorie burn or the most, you know, general, like people want to just be as efficient with everything as possible. It's like, Hey, I, what's going to give me the most bang for my buck. It's like a thruster, go do a million of them, burpees and thrusters. Um, but they, you know, there's, there wasn't much of a place for like single joint isolation exercises inside of CrossFit. Um, so that was a big gaping hole and, um, particularly around the, like the shoulder and looking at how, like the shoulders, such a, just a dynamic joint. And really all we did for shoulders was, you know, burpees overhead barbell presses and like, you know, ring dips or a muscle up, you know, which, and the muscle up wasn't really done by the vast majority of CrossFit participants. It was, it was, it was high enough skill. And those that did it were really doing it only on the heels of, you know, powerful kip. They weren't really developing the strength enough to do it, um, under their own control. So yeah you know, shoulder isolation exercises, uh, scapular strengthening movements, um, direct hamstring work was pretty neglected in, it was very neglected. I neglected it. I didn't even really appreciate, start to appreciate it until Ben Patrick, knees over toes guy sort of came into my awareness. And then he and I became, um, friends and I had a chance to you know, really, I mean, we all can learn from him. He has tremendous amounts of content out there, but I got to spend some time with him and really connect with him. And it just really, 
uh, got me to re- remember that this is a, this is an important part of the body that that needs some some love and you know traditional conventional deadlifts and even RDLs are just not they're not enough you know there's there's more to the hamstring than that um so i would say those are kind of the the big ones that that jump out to me and so that i think that could apply to you know a lot of people in their general training too like even if they're not crossfitters i don't i don't see a lot of people getting getting after the hamstring curl machine you know they're happy to go do lunges they're happy to do leg presses they're happy to do some of these bigger movements but they're not doing direct hamstring work you know they're if they're gravitating towards machines not a lot of machines are set up for true you know unilateral training there's a lot of you know bilateral machines that are out there they they tend to be a little easier for people to figure out anyway um and yeah so it, that that kind of would summarize it to me I'll just add to that, and I agree with everything that you've said. Unilateral is sorely lacking for most people, and it really shouldn't be because at large, you're still going to be doing the gross movement pattern. You could go single arm row. You can go for, as you said before, with um, split squats instead of your traditional squats. I think a lot of people are a bit insecure that they're going to leap behind their strength and possibly even size if they don't keep doing a movement that they've spent time doing. But as I just said, if you're doing a similar movement pattern, you're going to be getting elements that are just not there bilaterally. The ability to work on the stabilizers a bit more, the asymmetry, you're perhaps using one side a bit more than another. Um, The ability to resensitize your body to a stimulus. So instead of just smashing heavy, heavy squats to get a fatiguing effect to adapt and improve, you go to split squats, you'll be using a fraction of the load and be getting substantial benefits so that when you introduce the bilateral movement, be it a bilateral squat or a row after doing single arm rows, you're going to find that you've got this new capacity to progress and improve. So I found that to be the case. In addition to just isolation, I think that the compound work, as you said, was seen as the saving grace, the the you know, does every single thing in one movement. And they're fantastic. They should be a core part of your program. But I feel that people would keep doing more compounds when they could have just replaced the additional compounds that they're doing with some isolation work and perhaps fatigue themselves a bit less or target muscle groups that simply can't be as efficiently done with compounds. True. Yeah. You know, it's something just came to mind, which is, I find, you know, it's sort of ironic, which is that in the CrossFit world, you know, there were a lot of brands that were born out of CrossFit, a lot of, um, you know, equipment, supplement brands, uh, one brand in particular that had a, a huge impact on the CrossFit community. And I don't, I believe they were CrossFitters. I mean, they, they're now marketed to all different types of athletes, but the crossover symmetry, um, which was like a basically like a, a band like resistance bands and they had like a, a a little placard that you'd put up on the the wall and it was it was a series of rotator cuff you know strengthening exercises isolation exercise you know external rotations you know ATYT you know types of poles things like that um they were it, it was incredibly popular you know every crossfit gym for a while had one and it was like were the anti isolation fitness movement yet in every gym we got these things that people love that they go and do it so they're doing a ton of isolation training um and it was marketed as like this is what's going to save your shoulders you know because you're you know this is how you get your shoulders ready for this thing and it was like it was yeah you know i mean i i i still have a couple sets of them you know from my when i own my crossfit facility when i trained and um it's it's like okay we'll take a step back and recognize that this is just isolation training for the shoulder and perhaps some of the training you know could have been that you know it's like a group class hey and we did this you know for a period of time towards the end of my crossfit gym owner coaching days we would you know we we would have uh you know hey in between your sets of 
whatever back squats or the movement that people were all excited to do, you're going to come over here and you're going to grab one of these lighter dumbbells. And you're going to do some dumbbell ro extra rotations and just sort of like fill in space, right? So it's like, Hey, you're going to rest anyway. So why don't you go do something productive, um, for your shoulder and, People were happy to do it so long as it, you know, didn't get in the way of them doing the other thing, right? Because this is what they believe that they needed. And it's like, well, you could do this too. So kind of to your point, it's like, you know, people feel like they're going to have to give this thing, if they give this thing up in order to go over here and do this unilateral training that they might miss out on this powerful adaptation that they get from back squats. It's like, well let's find ways to sneak it in. And that's kind of what, you know, a lot of, a lot of the training programs I wrote early on for functional bodybuilding was like, you think you want this, but I'm going to sneak in some tempo push-ups before we go and do some, you know, of the other, you know, more flashy thing. For people that are returning to training after a break, be it a holiday or injury of some kind, what are the practical strategies that you recommend? Yeah, it's, we just... I just wrote an article about this maybe right right around the new year, right? We're we're coming up on March here, but um yeah, some of them were about setting kind of expectations first, you know, it's like if if you've taken a long layoff, then it's easy to um you know, you, probably your most like the memory of your fitness self that is most right there in your brain is the last workouts that you did. So you want to go back and think about that. Um, and that, that's, a, that's certainly a mistake because you set yourself up for, um, disappointment when you cannot perform, you won't be able to perform after a break. Um, I'm, and I'm thinking of like a longer, more considerable break, nor would it be safe for you to try and go and perform. You might be able to, but remember performance is not just, you know, the how how well you can exert force against the barbell it's you know how well you can exert force against the barbell and how resilient is your body to handle those you know equal and opposite forces that are coming into you um will you be able to recover from it so i like to tell people to think you know why don't you think back to the last time you took a break <laughs> from from training right and try and remember those moments because those are going to be probably the most familiar to how you're going to feel when you come back to the gym. The second thing that I talk about is, um, you know, people say, okay, start back easy. Okay. Well, what does that even mean? Uh, I like to think about it as like, leave the gym every day, knowing you could have done more. Like you, that you should want to, you should leave and be like, I totally left something on the table. Like a lot of people love to say, leave nothing on the table, put it all out there at the gym. Well, not when you're just starting up again, leave a lot on the table. Maybe the first week, you know, if you want to quantify it, it's like I left 50% on the table. And then the second week it's 60%, you know, or, or 40%, you know, that gets smaller. Right. Um, and do that past when you think you're ready to push it hard. <laughs> like you're in week three, you're like, I'm ready to get after it. Keep doing it. Um, because that gets you, it is a perfect opportunity for you to align to that principle of less is more, right? If you can, because if you can start to see the results that you want doing a little bit less, you just won, like, you, you know? <laughs> so um, that's that's a big one. And then uh, if it's a, if it's, I think that I like to give people like a, a, a concept of like, okay, now I'm asking you to hold back, which for some go-getters, it's, that might be the hardest challenge is to tell them to, to not. So I say, okay, well, let's replace any, any, t like if you were, let's say you were training five days a week before your layoff. I would say I want you to come back to three with three or four days a week. Like, but I know I got to get moving. I got to get you know I got to get back to my routine. That's fine. You were doing functional bodybuilding five days a week before you took the month of December off, or you know you took your two three week holiday. Now you're back. Let's do three days a week to start, or four, and then that fifth, fourth or fifth day that you were gonna do functional bodybuilding, I want you to just go for a walk or I want you to go for a hike or I want you to do something that's movement, keep the schedule, block it off, 
even go to the gym if you need to, but instead of hitting, picking up the weights or do something that's less intense, but it's movement oriented. And those would be some practical ways to approach, you know, this idea of like, okay, don't go too fast too soon because you're, you'll, you, the likelihood of injury burnout, um, you know, being sort of, uh, demoralized by your ability, your, your inability to perform to your old self, all of those we want to avoid. And this is how we're going to try and avoid it. Um, this is, this is kind of like the practical solutions that I've kind of come up with. So the detachment from where you were previously, accepting where you are currently, doing what you have to do, not an excessive amount, why suffer more than necessary if you can get the sweet spot of effort relative to returns. And I love that bit about filling the remaining schedule with other activities. I feel that a lot of people would gravitate towards just going back to the CrossFit gym, the park and training if you didn't put those restraints in place to occupy that habitual time that they usually do their activity. Yeah, totally. Is building muscle functional? (laughs) Yeah, like what is functional? Um, I mean, I think having muscle more... uh, muscle mass um, gives people a lot of uh, a lot of potential to apply it to functional, you know, things in their life. I mean, function really the best way I've heard it described is function is you the things that you do in your day, like and and functional fitness is fitness that allows you to perform the tasks of your life to the abilities that you want. The limitation on that definition in my mind is that not a lot of people have very f- demanding physical lives. Like lifestyle the, nowadays is, you know, to live my life, you know, from a practical sense with getting my kids to and from school, you know, the the shopping that I need to do for the household, the cooking, driving to and from work, the office, sitting at my computer, like it's minimal. I I need very little muscle mass to accomplish those things. Um, There's certainly the more muscle mass to a certain point that I have, the easier those things could become. But um, I don't like the idea that it's just, what are you, what's your, what are your daily tasks? Let's just train to that. Um, I, when you train beyond the demands of your daily tasks, you open up the opportunity to new wonderful things that you could do. <laughs> and I think that that's powerful. And I think that um, strength and muscle have, pr- there's there's carryover to so many different functional things that I think it's, a v- those two things in and of themselves are valuable to pursue by any means. So a bicep curl on a machine, you know, arguably has no f- functional like equivalent in life. Cause you, unless you're like talking about picking up a can of beer or whatever, you know, people make that joke. It's like, yeah, but, but building that muscle and creating, you know, a, a neural connection where, which allows you to apply force contractile, you know, force to this, this part of your body. This is highly transferable and functional to many things. Um, and so I, I, I really believe that just chasing, you know, strength and or building, you know, lean muscle mass is highly, highly functional. And, you know, the research shows that muscle mass as, as a correlate to like longevity and, and health as we age is it, it's irrefutable. It's like you have more muscle you are going, you know, that, that's, that's going to mean good things for you uh, as each decade of your life passes and hopefully many, many more to come will pass. So why are we not wanting people to get more muscular? <laughs> and, um, and, and that's what I, I mean, when I look at my parents now who are both in their 70s, 
that's what I want for them is do, do everything, you know, check all the boxes that optimize you building muscle because that's going to give you access to being f functional with, with anything. So eat more protein, dad, take creatine, dad, you know, do one resistance training set for each muscle group to failure every week, dad, you know, like do, do these things. I don't care, you know, that it doesn't need to be perfect, but just check boxes to, to give yourself the best chance at, at getting muscle. I like that longevity piece because one of the highest risks of mortality is falling. And one of the predictors of falls is not having muscle mass as one of the pieces. So people that don't have as much tend to fall more than people that don't. You can just see what happens there. If someone has a fall, they fracture a hip, then they're out of action. It could just create this spiral towards ill health ongoing. So if you can mitigate that by having muscle mass, great. I also like the saying, a bigger muscle has the potential to be a stronger muscle. So just to further what you said, Marcus, you can then, through that bicep curl that you've been doing, gaining some mass on, on that, you could then transfer that in your chin-ups to a stronger chin-up. It's just applying the bigger size of the muscle, then teaching it in a way which is functional for the activities you find enjoyable. That's going to be key. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, and I think some people... They, not that they don't rightfully so they start to think muscle might not be functional because the maybe the the image of muscle that m many people have individuals have is really like the competitive bodybuilder that's that's a muscle that's muscle that is the pinnacle of muscle on a human you know frame and uh that might I mean, arguably, but most professional bodybuilders, like they might certainly heavy weights, like they, they can't move particularly well. Um, and there might be some things that they're with their size and, and their sheer mass. Uh, they're just, this is off kind of <laughs> not uh, off limits for them. Like I can't. And so someone sees that they're like, well, like, gosh, if I get too muscle, too much muscle, I'm clearly not going to be able to do what I want to do in my life. Um, so, but of course, you know, we know that people don't just uh, have a protein shake and do their first set of curls and suddenly, you know, they can't scratch their head because their biceps are too big. <laughs> I'd, I'd argue that the average person, myself included in that mix, you can try as hard as you absolutely want. You probably aren't going to get grotesquely big unless you take certain things that would warrant that, but the average person is not going to have to worry about that. Train as hard as you possibly can in a sustainable way, recover, build some functional tissue, quote unquote, and don't worry about getting too big is my statement. It seems at public gyms, people have at large quite poor quality technique. They tend to chase quantity. Why is this the average way of doing things? I think more, I think, I think, I think the, the weight on the bar, more quantity is just, there's just a marketing around it universally that it's a little bit more sexy, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> um, you got more money, you're cooler, you're better. You got more of this, you know, it's like certainly in the, you know, in America or capitalist society, it's like more is better. Like yeah. it's a consumption. Yeah, bench. yeah. And so that, that, that maybe just carries right into, um, you know, the gym, I mean, also people with really well-developed physiques and muscles and, you know, they are lifting more than the beginners, <laughs> you know? So it's like, well, I, I mean, heck, I would walk into the gym when I was, when I, yeah, when I was a teenager and I saw the guy who had this, you know, bookshelf of an upper chest, like this thing was, I'd never seen, I was like, that's a, that's a muscle we have. And you know, granted, in hindsight, he was he was supplementing with some things, but he also was lifting a lot of weight, you know, and, and that wasn't I mean, there's no. No supplements that are going to lift the weights for you like he was doing four plates on an incline bench press. So I'm like, OK, that's something. And so you just start to see, like when you get into a gym, like the bigger, 
guys are stronger or the bigger girls are stronger. You know what? Uh, generally, guys are looking at this. Um, and so it's easy to think, okay, well, if I get those numbers or get the more weight on the bar, I'm going to have that thing that I see. Uh, so that's a very easy and common mistake to make. Um, but now I think that the fitness culture is definitely changing. And with access to so much more information, YouTube, folks like yourself, it just, you know, when people get to see beautiful movement, they're seeing more of it. They're seeing people move in really great ways. And even bodybuilders, you know, the, the science, the sciencey bodybuilders who are talking about m mechanics and moving with good range of motion and with technique, it's becoming cool. And I think that people really respect when they see good movement. Uh, when people see good movement, they respect it. When they see people lifting big weights, they, I don't think it's not that they don't respect it. It's just, it doesn't have the same meaning. I think people generally care more about the weights that they're lifting for themselves than anybody else cares about the weights that they're lifting for themselves. That comes to what you said earlier with no one cares about the weight you're lifting except for you. And I've seen that change over time as well. At 10 years ago, much more about being as strong as possible, lift as much weight as possible. But as you said, now movement quality is so much more impressive. And I often say this to people that I'm more impressed and I admire someone that is putting in effort and using a full range of motion regardless of the load. So if you get a beginner who's lifting barely anything, but their technique is on point, they're trying, you know, quite hard compared to someone who's advanced and they're just using quite poor technique and their level of exertion doesn't match what they're capable of. I admire the person using good technique for range of motion. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's also telling that, you know, there was a phase in my life where anybody that met me who was, you know, it's, it was obvious I was a fitness guy. Um, you know, the question was most commonly like how much you bench, like kind of thing. Like, that's not even a joke. It's like, how much do you bench? Like that is the met, the measurement of that is your self-worth Marcus. <laughs> totally. <Yeah. laughs> and then, but now when people meet me, it's like, Oh yeah, we know. Hey, what's your diet? Like they want to know yes. what I'm eating. They want to yes. know like, Hey, how do you like, cause there's education. They're like, okay, it's, I, they wanted to look good. They wanted to look like they were fit. And now they know that how much I bench has very little to do with that. And what I'm eating has everything to do with it. So they're like, Hey, hey so what, 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 what kind of diet you do? Like, it's funny. I just meet, you know, dads, you know, that are like of the, of my kids, you know, friends and at school. And they're like, uh, Oh yeah, you're, you're, Hey, what, what's, what's your, you know, what are you, <laughs> a bunch of protein shakes? <laughs> It's like I'm on the golf course with some guys. Yeah. Like, yeah. so what's your diet? I'm like, oh, we're we're leading off with this. Like, we just we just met. <laughs> it's and funny. they expect the response to be some succinct. Oh, okay, I could just go and apply that. Yeah. With no yeah, context I gotta keep, at all. I got to keep working on my my nutrition elevator pitch, which <laughs> I, I have been refining, but it's uh, yeah, it's a little bit <laughs> harder. When it comes to diet, why is there no one size fits all approach? We've got the vegan on one side and we have the person following a carnivore diet on the other both think they're right. Why is there no one size fits all diet? Um, cause they're both right. <laughs> cause right means it's working for them and working for them means that they're really what, <laughs> why it works is because they've done it consistently enough for whatever aspect of that diet actually is moving the needle for people. So if it's, if it's, uh, you know, let's say it's carnivore. Well, how, how did that get people to, um, potentially eat more protein than they were eating before? Oh, well that, that makes a difference, right? Or somebody who's I'm vegan and it's working. Well, the part of that diet that worked for them was it got them to eat less processed food and eat more whole foods. And as a result, they started to get better micronutrient balance and they started to control for calories indirectly. And guess what? They saw some benefits and they started to feel better because they weren't eating, you know, as much, uh, you know, sugar. Um, so the ones, why there's no one size fits all is because we're looking for, um, 
we're all looking, you know, f- successful diets like are are solving for the same questions. You know, your successful approach to eating is solving for the same question. It's a how do we control for quantity? How do we control for quality? And and by quality, I mean like the the amount of available nutrients, micronutrients in there. And how do we um, solve for kind of sustainability? Like that's like personal enjoyment. It's not too complicated. You can do it over and over again. So that's what that's what diets are just trying. That's that's what all nutrition approaches are solving for. Is does this get me the? I mean, does this control for calories basically in a way that suits my needs, um, without too much effort, or with an adequate enough effort that I can actually do it? Does it get me enough of the nutrients that I need to feel good? So a quality um, perspective, and does it also somewhat enjoyable, enjoyable enough that I can do it for, for long enough. And, um, you know, with every diet that's out there, there can be a period of time where it, where it's successful for you. And then a period of time where it's unsuccessful because it doesn't meet one of those criteria. And again, I go to the, the vegan example, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stories of people who are, you know, in their first year, two years of being vegan, they're thriving, they're winning. They're just, you know, because the vegan diet checked the quantity, quality, and sustainability boxes. But then in year three, they start to see some deterioration to their health and they start to have to get really a lot more specific about how they balance, you know, getting adequate nutrients. Now the quality of it is not, it's not working. They're not getting an adequate amount of something. And then they reintroduce, you know, a food group and suddenly, okay, the quantity, the quality, excuse me, is back on track. They're getting the micronutrients that they need. They're getting the right amino acid complements that they need, and they're just back to thriving. So that's why there's no one size fits all, because there's a lot of ways to get at those, those things that work and what works, you know, uh, what get, what gets you, you know, happy and excited to stick to it looks different for, for lots of people. And a great parallel with nutrition is exercise. If there was one superior way to exercise, we'd all be doing the same thing. That's why we've got calisthenics, we've got lifting weights, we've got the world of flexibility, stretching, yoga. There's so many and each just ticks a box that is relevant to your situation as described in your nutrition section. Well, it's um, it's just that the, the these these buckets in... I was going to say that with nutrition, we really have, you know, there are, there are certain needs that we have um, from from a nutrient standpoint. Whereas with with movement and with fitness, um, I don't know, it's a little more difficult to say like, hey, we all have these same movement needs um, because we all lead very different lives. Like, if you don't get enough of this nutrient, like you die, right? And that's categorically true for everybody. If you don't do a push up, you're not going to die. You know, if you don't if you if you don't move, you could actually survive just sitting on the couch. It's not a very enjoyable life, but like, you know, there I don't think there's a lot as many clear clearly defined needs yeah. in the movement it's, spectrum. So that's where I was like just going with If you with don't you, do your cardio, you're not going to like just fall over and die because you've got that baseline from life, but you don't get the benefits of nutrition just by living, you have to ingest. Yes. Yes. So whatever that, that one, that, that kind of subtle difference between movement and nutrition, I I think it, it impacts the, the conversations on, in these two different worlds. I think that's maybe what makes people get, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's what makes Maybe it's what makes nutrition more confusing or less confusing. I'm not sure, but there's something to that where, you know, nutrition is kind of unique in that there's certain, there's certain nutrients that we do need. And, you know, if we start to really evaluate the, the biochemistry and of how our bodies, you know, process nutrients and utilize them, you know, we can make arguments and then people can get really, you know, passionate about being like, you absolutely need to eat this thing. And then it's like, but I don't like that thing. It's like, but you need to do it. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's quite interesting. In the process of people finding their nutrition style that suits them, it's common for people to have 
issues with digestion and gut health. How can people go about navigating this experience and trying to improve their gut health? Yeah, so I suffered at various points in my life, suffered from really bad digestion. Um, the first experience of that was when I was in uh, when I was in in medical school. Actually, I was under a tremendous amount of stress and um, was just not living a life that I was passionate about. I was I was questioning what my my choice to be in medicine at the time, and just a very conflicted phase of my life, which led to uh, me just being in like an over stress nervous system state. And I had sustained a several injuries at that, t- at that point too, because as you know, like when you're training hard and you got all these other stresses, like that can, that can present in the way of, you know, overuse injuries and training stress. And, um, so then I was taking a bunch of Advil, you know, NSAIDs and those wreak havoc on your gut. I didn't know all these things were happening. I'd also been on a course of antibiotics for many years uh, to treat acne. And that I also didn't realize was problematic. Like I took, you know, the same antibiotic for two years straight, just completely obliterated my, you know, microbiome. And so all these things, I had a real, uh, problem with my digestion. And, and in the years since then, I've had a couple other bouts that have come up through high stress times. So I have a lot of experience around this and I've thought about it a lot. And coach a lot of people through it. And, um, and what I've certainly found is that the best way to go about this is to, um, you know, remove a lot. It's eliminating as many things, simplifying what we're doing. Um, because when you have too many inputs, you really can't, uh, identify what's problematic. You know, you, you got 50 variables in a, in a study that you're, you know, looking at, uh, that's not good science. And so I've kind of subscribed to, and, and, and a, an elimination diet is, is really, you know, one of the best tools that's out there to investigate what, how foods are interacting with your body. Um, and one of the, you know, you can get very extreme and you can look at something like the gaps protocol, um, where you basically just like have bone broth for, you know, a week, you know, it's like you start with just very simple things and then reintroduce one by one, the least offensive foods that we know of, um, that have the lowest allergen potential. And then you keep working your way up until you introduce the thing that suddenly, you know, ignites a digestive reflex where you're like, Oh, that didn't feel good. I got gassy. I got bloated. Okay. That's not a good thing for me. That's certainly one approach that people who are really suffering from bad digestion are happy to go through. And, you know, if you're constipated every day and you need, you know, laxatives and an enema to have a stool every morning, you're willing to try anything. But a lot of people aren't that far into it. They're looking for, they're like, I'm just, I'm a little gassy. I feel a little bloated. I just don't feel, you know, okay. I've kind of taught a five ingredient, you know, recipe or five ingredient meal approach, which is, which is exactly what I, you know, it's, it's, it is truly five ingredients. It's, there's five things on your plate and each of them in and of itself is an ingredient. So if you have a salad dressing that you buy at the store, that's got five, six, seven things listed on the label that doesn't belong on your plate for this protocol, for this thing. Cause you shake that up and you put dressing on your, on your lettuce and you think, Oh, that's one ingredient dressing. It's like, well, no, the dressing itself has five, seven, eight, ten 10 things in it. So a plate of five ingredient meal looks like I've got a potato. I've got a chicken breast. I've got a broccoli. I've got a great, I've got grapes and I've got a pat of butter, you know? And it doesn't have to be five things. It could be three things, but teach people to simplify their food dramatically. And by simplifying you like to five ingredients or less, you almost remove the opportunity to have anything that's processed. Uh, and not that all processing is bad, but, you know, packaged hyper palatable foods that have a lot of um, ingredients that are there just for the inter- for the entertainment of food, not for like the nutritional value, it removes a lot of those things. So then when they're not on the table, those are often very 
some of the most offensive things for you know digestive health. And so you start to do that. And then with five things on the on the plate, you know, if you do come across a day where you, oh, I had this plate of food and it I kind of got gassy or bloated or I had, you know, burps afterwards. Well, at least now you only have five things or maybe four things that you kind of have to investigate. <laughs> you know, you can actually you're doing a little bit better scientific method here. It's like, okay, well, I think it might have been the quinoa. So let me have, you know, no quinoa at my next meal, and then I'll have quinoa at my the, we, the the meal after that. Oh, look at that! You know, I can reproduce this thing that didn't feel good. Okay, good idea that that's probably a thing, and leave it off your diet for a period of time. Give yourself a break. Let your digestion heal or your digestive tract heal a little bit. Reintroduce it at a later time. Maybe you do okay with it, but right now it's not working well for you. Uh, so that's one approach, and then you know, just getting people to understand the, the common offenders that really create gut damage. So NSAIDs, which I talked about, people don't realize that, you know, they're taking Advil, they've got a, they've got a little nagging pain, a, a chronic thing that they're constantly trying to suppress the inflammation from. They're taking Advil every day for months and years at a time. That's really problematic. Uh, alcohol, really a bad one. Um, and then really, you know, sleep. Uh, the restoration of your digestive system when you sleep is, uh, you know, a big part of sleep. And when people are getting poor sleep or they're not, they're getting really interrupted sleep, that can be a big thing. Now that's not something people can just fix overnight, you know, like, and somebody who's like in a lot of pain might not be able to remove their Advil every day. But I know a lot of people that are just taking that habitually. They just pop through every morning. I have plenty of clients over the years who were like, I never, I heard, I, I heard your talk on gut health and I didn't have, a, I had no idea. I just stopped. I didn't realize I didn't need to be taking that. And I stopped taking it and that was, it made a big difference. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, on the top, like, it, it, and just to give more power to the, the sleep, you know, com conversation, I, it was when my second daughter was born and I went through you know, a very prolonged sleep deprivation with that, that my, my bouts of digestive health went just, you know, I, I came back up against this, like, oh, I haven't experienced this kind of digestive uh, challenge in, in years. And so just to, to show like the power of, of how sleep disruption can affect, I, I learned it very firsthand. Marcus Philly, ladies and gentlemen, it was an absolute pleasure speaking with you, mate. Um, just, Seeing someone who's been leading from the front for so many years, practicing what they preach, I think everyone that comes across your work just has infinite knowledge at their fingertips. They should be grateful. Where can they find out more about your work? Well, thank you for all those kind words and the compliments. I really appreciate that. And um, I really mean that. I, it's, uh, you know, to, to hear that from, from, you know, people I look up to and, and peers in the industry means a lot because I, while I try and do this for the consumer, the, the, the customers, the end consumer, I also, you know, as somebody who came through academia, like I, I care what my peers think about me too. And uh, because I think it's a sign that we're, you know, I'm doing the right things. So thank you for saying that. Um, people can find me, uh, you know, I'm on most social media platforms, but I think the best place to connect with what what we're doing is through our um, newsletter. So functional-bodybuilding.com is our website. But yeah, it's just a great way to connect. And um, we put a lot of energy and, and love into that on, uh, every single week. So that would be where I'd go and check us out. Awesome. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for listening. Visit fitnessfaqs.com to master calisthenics and become a bodyweight pro.